Welcome to the Open Forum. My, once again, we have that wonderful privilege of looking together into the Word of God to discover truth. If you've been reading the Bible and puzzling over a verse that uh, you would like to talk about or get information, rather, about it, uh, uh, please uh, call up if you can get through. <laughs> and we have a lot of people trying to get through and ask uh, your question about that verse, and we'll talk about it a little bit together before we go to our next caller. And please just plan to call not more than once a month because we'd like to share uh, this uh, opportunity to as many people as possible. Now, we're, let's take our first call tonight, please. Welcome to Open Forum. Hello? Yes, welcome to Open Forum. How are you doing? I'm very well, thank you. Uh, what is your question? Could you read um, Genesis 4, 9, 8 to 12 for me, please? Genesis 4. 49. Uh, verse 49, no, not Genesis 49, four. Verse eight, oh, Genesis 12. 49. Yeah. Oh, okay, I'll get there. Genesis 49, there we read in verse 8. Genesis 49, verse 8. Judah, thou art he wh whom the brethren, thy brethren shall praise. This is a a blessing that is coming upon them by Jacob, yeah. uh, who was their father, and uh, and it's in his old age, and now he's bringing, uh, by God, uh, God is using him as and giving him words to say God. as a blessing on his various sons. And in verse 8, he says, Judah, thou art he whom thy brethren shall praise, thy hand shall be on the neck of thine enemies, Thy father's children shall bow down before thee. Judah is a lion's whelp. From the prey, my son, thou art gone up. He stooped down, he couched as a lion, as an old lion who shall rouse him up. The scepter shall not depart from Judah, nor a lawgiver from between his feet, until Shiloh come, and unto him shall the gathering of the people be. Yeah. Binding his foal upon a vine, and his ass is cold under the choice vine. He washed his garments in wine, and his clothes in the blood of grapes. Now, what, what is your ask, question? What I want to ask you, I believe you have Mr. Camping, right? You have yes. Mr. Camping, right? Yes. I, I'd like to say that you are just like the racist, white, anti-Christ, so-called Jews, who call themselves Jews or not. Or the right and wrong, racist, pagan Romans, who teach the word that all oh, and that God is white, Jesus Christ is white, and that and that uh, Satan is black. Right and Christ, so-called Jews, who teach the word that all Christians that follow of Jesus Christ are enemies of God. Why won't you won't tell the world that Judah was the Jews got their name from Judah, and that Judah was a black man, and that Jacob was a black man, and so on and so on. Uh, uh, excuse me. No, no. Uh, huh? The fact is that uh, the Bible does not discuss color of skin. There are two times in the Bible when God focuses on a black person. One was in the days of Jeremiah. There was a faithful servant of the king. His name was... Uh, 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 Oh my, I forget his name, but he was a very faithful child of God, and uh, and God blessed him richly and actually emphasized that he was a black man. In the New Testament, God also talked about a black man uh, uh, who was very, very uh, much a child of God. God blessed him. He was the... Uh, he was the... Uh, uh, he was from... Uh, uh, he was the, uh, I forget the he exact knew, but title, know. but he uh, m uh, he was ministered to by uh, Philip, uh, and uh, and before our eyes, we, uh, we as we read about him, he too became a child of God. And so God has beautiful things 
to say about black people. And nowhere in the Bible does God discuss what color of skin Jacob was or Abraham or uh, any of the other patriarchs of the nation of Israel. But if we look at Israel today, we find that some are, are fairly brown skinned and some are more white skinned. Uh, but skin color does not enter anywhere into the idea of salvation except because God anticipated the very thing that has happened uh, that many people would look down on the black races. He very carefully gave us some of the finest uh, blessings uh, to that, uh, that he uh, came upon anybody, upon t two black individuals, one in the Old Testament and one in the New Testament. So no black person should ever, ever feel like the Bible in any way whatsoever cuts them down for one inch. Now, I admit that people who call themselves Christians have uh, 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 had a, a uh, many of them have had a uh, uh, some kind of a uh, crusade against black people for one reason or another, and it was totally unchristian, unchristian, totally contrary to the Bible, and tried to prove from the Bible that God had some bad things to say about black people. But it's totally their sin. It has nothing to do with the truth of the Bible. So you can, you can really believe it that uh, you don't feel at all, at all like anything about the Bible, cuts down a black person. But thank you for calling and sharing. And shall we take our next call, please? Welcome to Open Forum. Welcome to Open Forum. Incidentally, the black person of the Old Testament, his name was Ebed Melek, servant of the king. I just... I suddenly remembered that. Uh, and the uh, new man in the New Testament was the treasurer of, the, of, the, of a black race. And uh, he was in a very high authority. And he, uh, and, and he was ministered to by Philip. But uh, shall we take our next call, Kennedy. please? Welcome to Open Forum. Good evening, Brother Camping. Yes, good evening. Yes, I'd like to know from the Bible, uh, in the New Testament, it says in a couple of the, uh, uh, when Paul was writing to the Romans, I believe, or, uh, Peter, that they stated that, uh, the end is very near. Now, could you, can you explain to me what that means? Because we know that May 21st is the end. And, uh, they, they were saying in those days that it was near the end. Pray, be, you know, be prayerful. Well, you, you really uh, have to find a verse Paul. that you're, that you're quoting from or talking about because we have to see once what the rest of the of the whole verse says uh it's very, we just can't it's very difficult to try to answer a general question without looking at the whole verse because every word in the original language is very very important and as it's translated it is still very important uh in one sense of course uh, the Bible speaks, uh, for example, in Acts 2, in the last days I will pour out my spirit upon all flesh. And uh, in one sense, uh, the uh, beginning of the church age, which began in 33 A.D., was the last days as compared with the whole history of the world. The world uh, will exist for 13,023 years. We know that. And... Uh, for the first 11,000 years, there was no, uh, there, there was no, uh, church age as we have it, have had it uh, throughout the New Testament era. And so that whole period in one sense is called the end of the age. But, uh, uh the Holy Spirit, uh, that verse in Acts 2 also is addressing another pouring out of the Holy Spirit that occurred in 19, 88, when God began a final ingathering uh, 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 during the last 6,100 days before the day of judgment. And uh, so both are in view in that statement in Acts 2. But thank you. How come they didn't eat peppers and eggs in those days? How come 
they didn't eat eggs in the... Oh, I'm sure they did. The Bible doesn't say anywhere that they did not eat eggs. The no, Bible just an doesn't that emphasize an that. But um, uh, there's no no reason in the world why we would think that they did not eat eggs. But thank you for calling and sharing. And uh, uh, they didn't mention uh, marshmallows either in the Bible. And they didn't mention a whole lot of different foods in the Bible. But uh, but uh, the only word, uh, it was meat, that in the Old Testament there were unclean animals typifying those who are unsaved in the world. And there were clean animals typifying those who had... God had planned to save and did save, and and uh, uh, that's why those animals are mentioned and and, and some birds, but uh, and so far as other other uh, uh, foods, God mentions grains principally, wheat and barley and and oats and and rye, but uh, uh, which apparently was a very much uh, the part of the people of that day. But other fruits and so on, God simply speaks of, of, of uh, every tree had burning fruit and so on. But shall we take our next call, please? Welcome to Open Forum. Hi, Ms. Camping. Uh, I have one question, please. Uh, why was Jesus baptized? Jesus was baptized because he came to... Uh, demonstrate how he, as the high priest, uh, was also the lamb that was slain to make payment for our sins. He came as a high priest. Now, in order, the biblical rule was that God had established in the ceremonial laws of the Old Testament that whenever a high priest was ready to begin his priestly duties, he had to be uh, he had to be uh, ceremonially washed uh, to wash away his own sin and be prepared to uh, uh, to uh, 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 to uh, carry out his task as a high priest. Now Christ came as uh, to represent uh, uh, the fact that he was a high priest, uh, the high priest, as a matter of fact. And he had to be ceremonially washed. Now, he could not go into the temple. There there was a big basin of water, and there they normally would wash their hands and their feet as part of the, uh, the baptismal ceremony to prepare them, the priests, for doing their duties. But Christ could not go there because he was not the tri- of the tribe of Levi, of the Levitical priesthood. And... Uh, he was because he was of the tribe of Judah, so God dispatched J- uh, John the Baptist, who was uh, a pr- uh, really a priest because he was in the exact line of Aaron, both by by his his mother as well as by his father, and uh, and he came to administer the baptismal water. It w- but it had to do with Christ. Be- are beginning to demonstrate that he was a high priest. It was a different baptism than water baptism for the remission of our sins. It was focused on the remission of the sins just of the priest. Thank you very much. Wonderful answer. Thank you, sir. Thank you for calling. And shall we take our next call, please? Welcome to Open Forum. Welcome. Hey, Brother Campion, how are you? Very well, thank you. Uh, my question is, uh, Judges 11, uh, check, uh, verse 30, 31, Let's look 39 at that. and 40. Let's look. Judges, Joshua, Judges 11, verse 30 and 31, first of all. Let's look at those. There we read... Uh, And Jephthah vowed a vow unto Jehovah and said, If thou shalt without fail deliver the children of Ammon into mine hand, then it shall be that whatsoever cometh forth 
from the doors of my house to meet me when I return in peace from the children of Amnon shall surely be the Lord's or Jehovah's, and I will offer it up for a burnt offering. Let me explain a moment that Jephthah had been selected by the Jews to, and, and by God also, to uh, uh, lead the, the Israelites against the, the enemy, uh, the Ammonites. And uh, Jephthah was making a vow before he went to do, to do this, get at this war, that if he was victorious, then he would sacrifice whatever first came out of his house. And in those days, apparently, there were animals that were also living in the house. And he, I suppose, he envisioned, we're just speculating now, it doesn't say what he envisioned, but what did happen. Certainly he didn't expect, we're going to find out. He, uh, he uh, envisioned that uh, uh, there would a lamb come out or a calf, and that he would then sacrifice it as a thank offering for God giving him the victory. But now, what happened? Verse 39, we read, And it came to pass, or let's before that, uh, when he returned home victoriously, guess what? His only daughter, his only child, was the first one that came out of the house to congratulate you him. And, oh, my He remembered his vow that he would sacrifice whatever first came out of the, out of the, uh, uh, out of his house. And then uh, his daughter, uh, she uh, 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 was a faithful child of God, obviously. She was willing to die in order that her father's vow might be paid. And she said unto her father in verse 37, Let this thing be done for me. Let me alone two months that I may go up and down upon the mountains and bewail my virginity. Because that was a, that was a bad thing in, in those days. If you were a woman, you, you, the, the goal of your life was to bear children. And uh, because she was not even married yet and, uh, and uh, was uh, going to be sacrificed, she would never, never have uh, any opportunity to bear children. And so she asked for two months to bewail her virginity upon the mountains. And it came to pass at the end of two months that she returned unto her father, who did with her according to his vow, which he had vowed, and she knew no man, and she knew no man, and it was a custom in Israel that the daughters of Israel went yearly to lament the daughter of Jephthah the Gileadite uh, four days in a year. Now, what is your question? My question is, I, I couldn't understand that last part. Uh, as a burnt offering equivalent to what he had his daughter do as because you know being a virgin for the rest of her life or did he actually sacrifice her no a burnt offering meant that she would be sacrificed on an altar remember years and years earlier than that abraham was commanded by god to take his son isaac and sacrifice him and uh, we read about this in genesis and remember that uh, it was three days journey that he and his son and a servant uh, uh, to uh, uh, to assist they took a that walk all the way to mount ararat three days journey he had a lot of time to reflect on what he was doing he at the end of that three day journey he was going to put his son isaac uh, tie him up and lay him on an altar and he was going and he was going to have wood underneath him to burn and he was going to kill his son and and uh, burn him up as a human sacrifice now the same thing now is what uh, jephthah had to do to his only daughter isaac was the only son of abraham by sarah he had other sons by uh, by uh, uh, other other wives later on, or or actually by Hagar first, uh, one son Ishmael, but uh, that was only she was not really 
uh, his wife, although by nature, by the fact that she bore him a son, she became a wife. Uh, and then later on, after Sarah died, he bore eight more sons by by uh, 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 another uh, uh, woman, but uh, uh, another wife. But uh, uh, Isaac, he was he was ready to d- kill his only son Isaac just like Jephthah now actually did kill his only daughter uh, because he had vowed so to he do really this. Did. Now, what is your question? He really I did it. I wondering if he really did sacrifice her on the, on the altar. And, and yes, uh, now you see, the, uh, we, we recoil at this. We, in fact, there are a lot of theologians that try to say, try to change the meaning here somehow. As if, no, uh, it means this or it means that, no. The language of the Bible here will not permit that. He sacrificed his daughter. And both in, uh, and effectively, Abraham uh, uh, sacrificed his son because he actually tied him and put him on the altar and, uh, and raised his knife up to plunge it into uh, Isaac's heart. And he was that close. When God says, oh, hold it, Abraham, hold it, Abraham. Uh, uh, and uh, look, uh, there's a ram in the bushes that you can put on instead. But he was uh, effectively, he was, he, he was absolutely ready to do it because we read in Hebrews 11 that he, I believe it is, where it says that he somehow believed that maybe God would resurrect his son even after he's been offered as a sacrifice. At any rate, he wanted to be obedient. And the same way with Jephthah, he was obedient, and there was no... uh, He went all the way through it. Now, in both instances, it is a portrait, a beautiful portrait, a a grisly portrait, too, of course, of what God did to the Lord Jesus Christ. Christ was... God put all the sins on him of those that God planned to save uh, already before he ever created mankind. And God found him guilty, and God sacrificed him. And God speaks of him as his only begotten son, using the same language that he used when he spoke about Abraham. And uh, when we recoil at what Jephthah did, his only, his only daughter... We, uh, we should also recoil and think, oh my, look how, what God did in order that He might save me from my sins. He killed His, He killed God Himself, because Christ never ceased to be God. And how could that be possible? Well, it's very mysterious, of course, how all of that happened, but it did happen. And so it is, helps us to understand and be in awe of what God had done in order to make payment for our sins. But thank you for calling. Well, thank you and for your sharing. answer, uh, Brother Camping. And uh, so Jephthah was a child of God. He def- definitely was a child of God. Okay. Uh, uh, from everything we can read about him, he definitely was a child of God. Now, he was in, I think if I remember, he was an illegitimate son, wasn't he not? Uh, in the early, uh, I think it says that. But, you know, God uh, uh, did use the idea that if someone was illegitimate, they could not be a child of God. But that was only a portrait. He, uh, not only in this instance, but also in the case of David giving birth to an illegitimate son by Bathsheba, uh, then God assures us that uh, by the, what David is saying, uh, that words that God gave David, that I shall go to him, uh, indicated that God saved that illegitimate baby of David to indicate, now wait a minute, don't get mixed up. When God uses illegitimate, illegitimate son as a portrait or a picture of someone who will never become saved, that is only a portrait. It is not a, the fact that any illegitimate, illegitimate child cannot be saved. They can become saved just as easily, readily as anybody else. 
But thank you for calling and sharing. And shall we take our next call? Please welcome to Open Forum. Brother Campin? Yeah. It's not the Bible that looked down on black people. It's races of America. And there's a church on every corner, and everybody says that they're saved. How can this be? In the Song of Solomon, chapter 1, 5 and 6, would you read that, please? And well, it's talking there about the Shulamite, I am black. And God is not using that as a... Uh, uh, in fact, that Shulamite in the Song of Solomon is a picture of the true believers. She is not a picture of unsaved people. She's a picture of true believers. And, uh, and uh, it's like Ebed Melech. God is using a black person uh, to demonstrate that they are right there with all the other true believers. It is people who call themselves Christian and really have not really read the Bible car carefully and who are using the Bible to uh, to satisfy their own uh, wrong ideas, their own uh, 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 ideas about race and so on, and it's a horrible thing that they have done. But that that is not because it is uh, that they've read the Bible correctly. It's because they have read it with their own prejudices and and uh, put their own spin on it. And so, the, but the Bible does not say anything against the black race. That I don't know anything in the Bible that says anything negative. But thank you for calling and sharing. And shall we take our next call, please? Welcome to Open Forum. Mr. Yes. Captain? Yes, go ahead with your call. Yeah, listen, first I got a statement. I just heard this on Hannity today on the radio when I was changing channels. Um, Wachovi Bank is taken out of all their Christmas trees throughout the United States because somebody of an opposite faith said it bothers them. So because of that, they want to be politically correct. And I'm like, I just get mad even as a Christian. I get upset that, of course, it's all the way the tide's turning. But I feel like I should call Wachovia Bank and say, you know what? I'm a Christian, and I'm taking my money out of the bank if you don't have a Christmas tree in there. So I did want to ask you if, if that's something that we that's can it. Excuse me. Or, Excuse or, me. We have to pause for this message. We have a caller on the line who is upset and angry because a bank, a local bank apparently, uh, has decided not to put up a Christmas tree this Christmas because of their own public relationship with their customers, however they understand it. And let me say this. If you're going to look around at what others do and uh, feel angry if they don't do it the way you would like to do it, uh, you're you're moving in the wrong direction. We can't live out the lives of other people, either your bank or anybody else. Uh, if you don't like your bank, you have the great privilege of moving to another bank. But you don't have to get angry about it. Uh, uh, they have their pr privilege. They're not breaking the law in what they're doing. Uh, and... Uh, and uh, uh, you're, uh, if, if we go through life with an angry outlook at these kind of things, we are in deep trouble with God. We should remember that all our desire is, I want to make sure that I am being as faithful as possible to God, and I know that anywhere I look, I'm going to see things happening that are are sinful against God, and they revolt me at times, but that's that, that's not my business. My business is to make sure that I am doing the will of God, and we want to keep our eyes on the Lord and on our mirror, because in the mirror we're looking at the first line of offense, namely me, that uh, I want to make sure that I am not doing wrong and uh, just to become become angry because somebody else is sinning 
No, we must never do that. That sin is everywhere. Or because someone, they may not even be sinning. They may only be doing something that we don't agree with. And we think it's sinning. And so we took the bait and we became angry when we shouldn't have been angry. And so it caused me to sin. My, my, uh, we don't want to fall into that trap at all. But thank you for calling and sharing. And shall we take our next call, please? Welcome to Open Forum. Yes. Before I get to First Thessalonians 5, a few weeks ago, a woman asked you about John 17, 6. What said, which the Lord responded, I have manifested thy name unto the men which thou gavest me out of the world. And you gave her, gave her an answer about Matthew 28, 19, about God is three distinct persons and we cannot understand him. He's mysterious and all that. Like if the Lord Jesus never wrote uh, Matthew 10, 19 and 20. No, excuse me. What is your, excuse me. What is your question? You are giving a number of verses here, but uh, do you want us to talk about it or have you a question about one of these verses? My question is coming from First Thessalonians 5. But my point is, in Galatians 2.16, which you quote every day, you always talk about what the Lord Jesus Christ said, what you said about the law. Excuse me, Galatians 2.16 is not talking about the same subject that First Thessalonians chapter 5 is. Now, what is your question? What verse do you want to talk about? Galatians 2.16 has to do with believing. Galatians 2. Nothing about. You said he, he said that, but Paul said nothing. Paul included the apostles as to him believing as they believe. You never read that, te- you never read that text. You jump all over the place and give your understanding of. I'm, what I'm to, sorry. What I'm sorry. What is your question? Now you're talking. You're talking about all kinds of different verses. They all have different focuses on the gospel. Now, which verse do you want to talk about? Or you'll have to uh, confine yourself to one question, or we will have to go to the next call. I'm very sorry about that. What verse do you want to talk about? I'm going to read the first. Seven verses. What verse? First Thessalonians five. First Thessalonians five. Um, All right, let's look at First Thessalonians five, beginning with verse one. There we read, but of the times and the seasons, brethren, ye have no need that I write unto you, for yourselves know perfectly that the day of the Lord so cometh as a thief in the night. That has been taught. All through the church age for 1955 years, that was God's command that you are not to know when his time was come. So uh, that's why he's saying you know perfectly that he's coming as a thief in the night. But then he says in verse 3, for when they, that is those who have been in the churches and have thoroughly learned that nobody can know when he's coming. He's coming as a thief in the night. When they shall say peace and safety, that is, uh, uh, they are saying Christ is coming as a thief in the night, but they are uh, secure in Christ. They don't have to worry whether he comes tonight or next year or whenever. Then, and this is the scary part, then sudden destruction cometh upon them as travail upon a woman with child and they shall not escape that's a terrible terrible statement uh, 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 warning then it goes on to say but there are some others uh, that are uh, he, that God is talking about but ye brethren are not in darkness that that day should overtake you as a thief for those who believe he's coming as a thief in the night they are in the night and he's coming as a thief because they don't know when he's coming they don't want to listen to the bible but he's saying here that there are others who do know they are not in darkness and christ is not coming as a thief for them you're all the children of the light the children of of the day 
and are not of the night nor of the darkness. Therefore, let us not sleep as do others, but let us watch and be sober. That is, be of a sound mind. Let us watch. For they that sleep, sleep in the night, and they that be drunken are drunken in the night. And both drunkenness and sleeping has to do with those who whose spiritual eyes have not been open to the truth. And because we're past the end of the church age and we're living in the last days where God is giving us that information so that we in turn can warn the world of uh, that judgment day is coming, uh, 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 we, we, uh, the Bible is very, very clear that we have to know the day. And we do know the day. Now, what is your question? Saying camping. That is not saying that at all. That's your interpretation. The text says, But of the times and of the seasons, brethren, I have no need that I write unto you. He's talking to the church at Thessalonica. He said, for you yourselves know perfectly that the day of the Lord comes as a thief in the night. Be aware of that. For when they shall say peace and safety, that day is not referring to who you're talking about. That day is referring to the world. Jesus said, my peace I leave with you, not as the world gave it. And then he, he underlined that with John three seventeen to 19. Look, I'm sorry. I'm sorry. All we can do is read this verse, and it's talking about, that's very plain, and you can argue it away, and I can't open your spiritual eyes. I can only tell you what the verse is saying. It's saying that sudden destruction will come upon them, and he's talking about those who are saying he's coming as a thief in the night. And if you don't uh, understand that, I, 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 I can understand. And until God opens our eyes, we can't know. And uh, there, every church you go to, that's what they teach, that Christ is coming as a thief in the night. And so you seem to think that you have a terrific amount of authority to say that, that Christ is coming as a thief in the night, because your pastor or your the elders or or this church or that congregation or that denomination they all agree and my my how can they all be wrong well that's that's because they're not listening to the whole bible and so uh, that's all i can do is tell you what the bible says and if you under have a different understanding that's your privilege and uh, I, uh, I i i can pray for you but i cannot help you to understand but thank you for calling and sharing. And shall we take our next call, please? Welcome to Open Forum. Hello? Yes, welcome to Open Forum. Okay, thank you. Um, Revelation 22, 14, 15. Revelation 22, verse 14 and 15. Blessed are they that... B blessed are they that do his commandments, that they may have the right to the tree of life and enter through in through the gates into the city. Uh, for without our dogs and sorcerers and whoremongers and murderers and idolaters and whoever loveth and maketh a lie. Now, what is your question? Okay, you often have people question about their pets. And I was wondering what was that uh, verse, you know, referring to, because if in 15 it says, but without our dogs. Oh, well, now you see, but look, look, look what happens. Uh, pits have to do with death. That's a synonym of the grave, uh, uh, of being under the wrath of God. The wages of sin is death. And right. death is associated with the grave, and the grave is uh, uh, typified by words like the pit, uh, and uh, uh, or by being under the wrath of God. It can also just mean that, but anticipating the fact that eventually you will die. But uh, but at the time of the judgment day, May 21, mm -hmm. uh, uh, next year, at that time, uh, there's going to be this this prophecy is going to be fulfilled because all those who are true believers who have ever lived on the face of the earth 
will mm -hmm. enter into heaven uh, to be with Christ forevermore, and they will enter not just in their soul existence like they did when they died, but they'll be entering in also with their bodies, their new eternal resurrected bodies and those who were living at that time will have instantly been changed into their glorious uh, eternal body and and go into heaven and so every true believer will have entered in through the gates into the city of god namely to be with christ forevermore in the kingdom of god but where are seven almost seven billion people uh, uh, other people, they will be left behind. They will be in the day of, uh, uh, enduring the day of judgment. Right from day one, there will be millions dying each day. And it's, uh, but outside, uh, and when he's talking about verse 15, dogs and sorcerers and whoremongers and murderers and idolaters, these are all figures of speech to indicate those who are still in rebellion against God, who have never become saved, and uh, they will, they are outside, they are left behind, and all the true believers have entered in. This is literally going to take place very definitely in another five and a half months. Okay, well, thank you. Thank you for calling and sharing, and shall we take our next call, please? Welcome to Open Forum. Yes, hello, Brother Camping. Can you hear me? Yes, very well. Yes, good evening. I uh, hope you're doing well. I have a question for you uh, specifically about uh, the various type of Bibles out there and the translations, publishers, and uh, what I'm trying to do is I'm trying to find out the most uh, accurate source Bible that I can use to uh, to understand God's Word and to do my studying and and. Well, uh, I know that the, the authorized version of the King James Version is probably the most accurate source, but there are many uh, different types of publishers that have this, and I know translation seems to get lost throughout the no, different publishers yes. that make this book, and I'm, I'm just trying to f figure out which is the best source, no. and whether a good concordance to go along with that would be good. I could take your answer offline, and yeah. God bless you and Family Radio. Thank you. No, the publisher, if they uh, publish what they call the authorized text, the King James text, it is always the same. Otherwise, they would be a renegade publisher of some kind, and they would be telling a big lie. They always publish the same text. If they if they say it's King James authorized, you can you can depend upon it. Uh, but the publishers also make a lot of money. When a new translation comes out, and there have been many, many new translations in the last 50 or 60 years particularly, and they're all inferior, quite inferior to the King James. And, uh, and they sell a great many of those other translations because people think that they're going to find something better in a, in a newer translation. But the King James, which translation which is now about 400 years almost exactly 400 years since the first uh, copies were published uh, right after the printing press was uh, in invented uh, that uh, it has remained the the best th that there is but thank you for calling and sharing and shall we take okay. our next call please welcome to open forum hi hello hello Go ahead with your call. Paul mentions in the Bible how he has a thorn on his side. What does that mean spiritually? He had a thorn in his side. That's a good question. I don't know exactly the uh, the verse it is in, but I do know the verse that he c complains that he had a thorn in his side. And that's a figure that is taken from the Old Testament. In the Old Testament, God stipulated that because they, the Jews had not been faithful in, uh, in uh, removing the heathen uh, nations that uh, in the promised land, the land that really belonged to the nation of Israel, and they did not, these heathen nations did not want to serve the God of Israel, and so they were under the wrath of God. 
And the Jews, the Israelites rather, were very, they were Jews of course, but uh, they uh, were not always faithful in removing them. And so God had so told them in the Old Testament, there are going to be pricks in your eyes and thorns in your flesh. Uh, in other words, they're going to harass you because of uh, the, that you had not obeyed what I had told you to do. Now, here's the Apostle Paul. He is he is uh, uh, turned against the Pharisees. He was one of the uh, leading Pharisees and truly believed that Christ was not the Messiah. Now Christ saved him, and now he understands tremendously well who Christ is, that Christ is the Messiah. But, oh, my, as he uh, tries to uh, speak to his fellow Pharisees, his fellow Jews, he is uh, troubled greatly. He's been uh, stoned uh, and left for dead. He's been uh, uh, beaten, and he's been... Uh, uh, he's been uh, 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 again and again, and he has... Uh, they uh, and that's what he's saying. They are like pricks in my eye, or they are thorns in my flesh. Uh, I am uh, uh, I'm greatly troubled by them. And yet he learned also, as all of us learn, if we're a child of God, our trust is not in me, not a bit, not a bit. My trust is in God, and he, God knows all about the uh, torments that we might be going through and he has his own purposes for it just like he had his own purposes for the apostle paul but uh, he was talking about the the uh, jews that he was trying to bring the true gospel to and they just they just uh, were like a, a, a terrible terrible uh, situation to him every time again and again they were thorns in his flesh but thank you. thank you. Thank you for calling and sharing. And shall we take our next call, please? Welcome to Open Forum. Yes, Brother Camping? Yes, welcome to Open Forum. Uh, yes, can you hear me? Yeah, let's uh, come a little okay. closer to your phone. Then. Okay. Uh, can you hear me now? Yeah, let's try it. Okay. Um, I, I was uh, speaking with someone the other day. And the question came up, they had asked me, where does my free will come in to accept Jesus as the Son of God? And it really caught me by surprise, and I didn't really have an answer for them other than we don't accept, we don't accept him, he accepts us. Well, I wasn't fact, sure whether that was the correct, the yeah. correct answer. Well, the, yeah, that's, that's, your, your answer was absolutely correct. But we, you know, we have a free will. Every human being has a free will. We can decide that we want to join this religion, or we can join that religion, or we can join that denomination, or the other denomination. Uh, we can decide a lot of things about what we want. We can decide, I want to get saved, and I'm, I'm going to choose for Christ. We can do all that. We have free will to do that. But what is not added is, that we're not saved because we have free will or that we chose. We're saved because God chose us from the very beginning of the world. If you read Ephesians chapter 1, he speaks there, God speaks there about uh, 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 those who are predestined to become, uh, to eventually become saved. We read in in Ephesians chapter 1, verse 3, Blessed be the God and Father of our Lord Jesus Christ, who hath blessed us with all spiritual blessings in the heavenlies in Christ, according as he hath chosen us in him. Before, that is he, the Father, hath chosen us in him, that's Christ, before the foundation of the world, that we should be holy and without blame before him in love, having predestinated us unto the adoption of children by Jesus Christ to himself, according to the good pleasure of his will, to the praise of the glory of his grace, wherein he hath made us, he hath made us, accepted in the beloved. It's all the action 
of God. And so, sure, people have free will, and they, and they believe they have chosen for Christ, but that doesn't mean a thing and at all. No human being can say, I chose for Christ, and therefore God saved me. Uh, that, that, uh, that is absolutely contrary to what the Bible is teaching. Thank you so much. Thank you for calling and sharing. And uh, shall we take our next call, please? Welcome to Open Forum. Hello, Mr. Kempe. Yes, welcome to Open Forum. Yeah, hi. Um, I read your book. Uh, I read quite a few of them online, actually. Uh, I, I, I'm sorry. Speak a little. Uh, could you turn your radio off? Maybe that's creating a problem. And I don't understand that no one calls up to critique your work. I think that's interesting that no one ever calls up and says, you know, they read this and this is wrong with it or the other. But I find that you base everything on numbers that you derive, and then you try to find the lowest common denominator from those numbers and then give it a spiritual meaning, and then everything's surrounded by the earth being 7,000 years old. Is that pretty much correct what you do? Now, excuse me, you know the fact is, if you've never heard anybody critiquing what I am teaching, you have never, you haven't listened very much to the open forum because this is constant that people are critiquing. They don't like what I teach and, and, uh, and it's also very healthy for this to happen to me because it keeps me very honest. I want to make sure that what I'm teaching is faithful to the Word of God. And with that in mind, I pray all the time, Oh, Lord, oh, Lord, I never want to teach something contrary to thy will. And I value every call, even those that are negative and, uh, and, are, uh, and there are those who, uh, who uh, understand and and we can talk together and have a pleasant conversation and there are those who don't understand and and I can understand why they don't understand until God opens a person's eyes God has to do that they're not going to understand I've used the apostle the God gives us the example of the apostle Paul before God saved him on the road to Damascus he was absolutely convinced, and he was a real theologian. He was a Pharisee of the Ph He was under the uh, teaching of Gamaliel, whom the Bible speaks of with high regard as a teacher, and uh, he was utterly convinced that Jesus was a, an imposter, that it was a terribly wrong thing to believe in him, and he was ready and, and was killing people who were Jews and beginning to follow Christ. Then Christ opened his eyes, and in no time flat, he is teaching all about the Lord Jesus as the Messiah. And uh, it's all, uh, we have to wait upon God to open the eyes. That's why we must never, never become frustrated or angry at someone who disagrees with us on any p point at all, because we... Uh, we know that if they don't understand, we can't convince them. We, it may, something may be very plain to us if God has opened our eyes and not be at all plain to that individual. And so we, there, we never, never want to become uh, in tension with, against someone uh, or frustrated against someone who does not see what we see. We just have to pray for them and hope that God will open their eyes. Um, but the thing is, you just what you just said. People critique your radio show, but no one critiques your books. In your books, you say a lot of things. No one ever calls them and talks about. I mean, sure they talk about the lowest common denominator of the numbers and the meaning that you get to it. But no one ever calls up and says, you know, on page such and such, I read this and 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 I don't agree with that. It's because your books are so confusing. You you give numbers. You say a number like 1988, and then you say we we at the state. Yeah, I, I'm, I'm, I'm sorry, but you, you know the main subjects that are, I have written about so that people can read it very carefully what, where this information came from in the Bible are the same subjects that we talk about on the open forum. God in his mercy, and oh, it's a wonderful mercy of God, allows 
this kind of a program to go on. It's been going on for 50 years, at least five nights a week, at least for an hour and a half a night. And it gives a, an opportunity for uh, again and again and again to discuss those things which are written in these books. And, uh, uh, and uh, so it's not necessary that they have to quote a page or a, a verse from the, or a, a paragraph or a sentence from the book, uh, they all they have to do is listen for a little while to the open forum, and they'll hear that same kind of information on the That's open forum. So and that is where the you're, you're, criticism. You're digging your own grave, and I appreciate that. You're just talking, 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 and you're, you're what you're saying. If anybody was intelligent and thinking, they're going to realize that you're just running off, and you really don't know what you're talking about. You, you, you like to make a lot of statements and say a lot of things, but it don't make any sense. It doesn't make any sense. I read the Bible. I don't get what you're saying. Maybe the Lord has not my spiritual eyes, but well, that, <laughs> but I'm pretty sure it's just rhetoric on your part. I understand. Anyway, I understand what you're talking about. Hold on, I'll run and finish this right after this message. We have a caller on the line who is upset because apparently he believes I'm not criticized enough in what I teach, and I'm just digging my own grave just as I go my own way. Let me say, first of all, that I am not the authority. I am not the authority. I'm a teacher pointing to the Bible. It is the authority. And, uh, and I welcome discussions that we have because in that way I am being corrected if, when I need correction because all I care about is that the Bible is faithfully declared. And, uh, you know, uh, uh, have you ever thought about it? All the preachers in the world, how many of them, they, a lot of them preach one sermon every Sunday or maybe two sermons sometimes, and uh, how many of them subject themselves after they have preached their sermon to a wide open discussion that anybody can enter in on, not only from their own congregation, but also from anybody who uh, comes from some other congregation. And it just does not happen. It would be exceedingly unusual if that did happen. And yet, by God's mercy, very deliberately, God guided us uh, to uh, start the Open Forum program about 50 years ago. Uh, be, as, and as I was teaching... I there I put myself right out in the marketplace you know on this program we do not monitor the calls anybody can call they can be as negative as they want to be negative and we take the call uh, as long as they obey the rules and only ask one question a month because we uh, have so many people trying to call and we talk together and I can fully empathize with them if they don't understand. It simply means that God has not opened their spiritual eyes. It doesn't mean that God will not. God still can do that. But uh, I, and sometimes, even as uh, they are talking to me in a very negative way, I'm learning for just from what they're talking about. And they may not realize it, but they are critiquing me and helping me to understand even more fully where the truth is. And uh, uh, But finally, I am not the authority. The Bible is the authority. And But because we are... I are just wide open. We're not, nothing is hidden. There's no deceit. There's no scams. No, uh, no, uh, uh, tricks of any kind. Everything that we, uh, that we have been teaching has also, or almost everything has been written about and, and is offered free of charge to anybody. They don't even have to pay any money to get a copy. They can download, uh, many of the uh, things we've been writing. Uh, from the open, from the internet, uh, they can uh, uh, call or write to get a free copy, postage paid, and so I don't know how we can do it any more open <laughs> than that. And and uh, we don't uh, yell back when we're when we're yelled at, when I'm yelled at. We I understand. I I I can be very empathetic 
because except for the grace of God, that's where I would be. And I know it is only God's mercy that he has opened my eyes. It has nothing to do with my intelligence or my anything else. It's just the mercy of God. And why in the world was God merciful to me? But thank you for calling and sharing. And shall we take our next call, please? Welcome to Open Forum. Good evening, uh, Brother Camping. Yes. I'm a long-time listener, first-time caller. Uh, sounds like I'm talking to Dr. Laura, or at least that's what her callers say. But nonetheless, uh, Brother Camping, for 10 years I've been listening to you, and uh, I, you're, I just uh, enjoy your teaching and your consistency in the Word, and just praise God. Uh, uh, I'm reading in Job, Sir Job 24, and... Uh, Job 24, 24. let me turn to that. Job, Job, uh, I'll get to it in a minute. 24, and which verse? Uh, Verse 1, uh, verse 1, sir. Job 24, verse 1, we read... Why, seeing times are not hidden from the Almighty, do they that know him not see his days? Uh, and that is your verse? Yes, sir. And what is your question? Well, it, it seems Job is asking here, I guess he's, he's talking to the his friends that were were trying to convince him of, of his sin but also he, in, in, in this part he's asking God uh, is he not asking God why he why he's not setting times for judgment is he referring to his particular judgment or is he really well you know you've, uh, you've uh, offered a very very important verse it's a very lovely verse Uh, First of all, it is answering the question, there are those who try to think for a moment that Christ would not know the day or the hour, and and Christ is eternal God. And that's why it says, seeing times are not hidden from the Almighty, and Christ is Almighty God, just as the Father is Almighty God, as the Holy Spirit is Almighty God. And so uh, anyone time anybody thinks that the Lord Jesus is, doesn't know that the whole timeline of history, when he is God who has established the whole timeline of history uh, from the very beginning, uh, then uh, uh, how can that be that Christ does not know? He absolutely does. But, but then the, the next phrase, that's a very interesting phrase, uh, do they that know him not see his days? Now, the fact is that uh, for almost the whole history of the world, we could not know what the final days of the, of the history of the world is. God had decreed that again and again and again uh, during the 1955-year period of the church age. Nobody is to know. But this verse comes into full play when we get right to the end because finally it is God's intention that the true believers will know his day. Uh, uh, As we read in Ecclesiastes chapter 5 verse 8, we will know time and judgment. And as we read in in, uh, Revelation 3 verse 3 where God says... uh, If therefore you shall not watch, I will come on thee as a thief, and thou shalt not know what hour I will come upon thee, indicating we are to watch. And the Bible talks a whole lot about watching, even in Mark chapter 13, where God, in the context of where God is saying, no man can know the day or the hour, but but we are to watch. And finally, because we watch, there came a time and that's just in our day, and we happen to be living at that time, that we do know the day and the hour. We know the time and uh, that uh, a lot about Judgment Day. 
All right, sir. Thank you. I've read those other verses, and and thank you, Brother Campion. Thank you for calling and sharing. And uh, shall we take our next call, please? Welcome to Open Forum. Brother Campion? Yes. Proverbs 30. You got Proverbs 30. Five and six. Five and six. Let's look at that a moment. Proverbs 30, verses 5 and 6. We read, Every word of God is pure. He is a shield unto them that put their trust in him. Uh, Add thou not unto his words, lest he reprove thee, and thou be found a liar. Be careful, Harry. I'm sorry. The fact is that, you know, uh, we, that this is picked up in Revelation 22, verse 18, where God says, if anyone adds to the words of this prophecy, I will add, or the book of this prophecy, I will add to him the plagues written herein. Or if you take away from the words of the prophecy, uh, and uh, that's what God is warning here, the Bible is not to be tampered with at all in the original languages. We can, we can check out the translators because they were not inspired, but the original languages of the Bible, they were right from the mouth of God. And this is what God has in view here. And so shall we take our next call, please? Welcome to Open Forum. Yes, Mr. Capping? Yes, welcome. Yeah, a while ago, somebody called about a Christmas tree. Yes. And if you go to uh, Jeremiah 10... It is not talking about a Christmas tree. It's talking about the building of an idol. There's nothing in there about a Christmas tree. Uh, We can look at those verses uh, 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 for a moment. Jeremiah 10, 5. Chapter 10. Uh, Let's look. Jeremiah chapter 10. Verse 1 through 5. All right, 1 to 5. We'll look look at that. Jeremiah 10. Hear ye the word which Jehovah speaketh unto you, O house of Israel. Thus saith Jehovah, I uh, learn not the way of the heathen, and be not dismayed at the signs of heaven, for the heathen are dismayed at them. For the customs... Uh, uh, of the people are vain for one cutteth a tree out of the forest the work of the hands of the workmen with the axe they deck it with gold they fasten it with nails and with hammers that it move not they are upright as the palm tree but speak not they must needs be born or carried because they cannot go Be not afraid of them, for they cannot do evil, neither also is it in them to do good. For as much as there is none like unto me, unto thee, O Jehovah, these are, thou art great, and thy name is great in might. Who would not fear thee, O king of nations? For to thee doth it appertain, for as much as among all the wise men of the nations uh, and in all their kingdoms there is none like unto thee. But they are altogether foolish. The stock is a doctrine of vanities and so on. It is talking not about a fig tree, a a Christmas tree at all. It's talking about the construction of an idol. If, uh, uh, if you would go into a Buddhist temple, for example, you would see many idols of uh, Buddha. Some smiling, some frowning, some doing this and some doing that. They were all built by mankind, designed by mankind. And then you see these dear pilgrims come in and they, and they burn 
candles in front of that Buddha and they say their prayers and expect that hunk of wood that has been painted and carved out and then painted that that somehow is going to make an impact upon their life that that is their God and that's what God is talking about that uh, where we are trusting in anybody but God himself it is an idol but it's not 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 talking about Christmas trees at all unless we worship that Christmas tree now there is a song that oh Tannenbaum Tannenbaum I think that's a German word and how much I love thee and so on and it almost sounds like that tree in the mind of that uh, that poet uh, was more than just a tree but uh, that isn't the way anybody uh, looks at a Christmas tree it's just something to don't uh, to put a lot of ornaments on and uh, put the gifts under and and under no circumstance ordinarily would anybody look at a Christmas tree as their God. Thank you so much for your explanation, Mr. Cappy. Thank you for calling and sharing. And shall we take our next call, please? Welcome to Open Forum. Yes, Brother Kevin, how are you tonight? I'm very well, thank you. Yes, uh, Revelation chapter 1, verse 8. Revelation chapter 1, verse 8. There we read, I am Alpha and Omega. Incidentally, Alpha is the first letter of the Greek alphabet, and Omega is the last letter. In other, and so it's another way of saying, I am the beginning and the end, and God defines that. He says, I am Alpha and Omega, the beginning and the ending, saith Jehovah, saith the Lord, rather, which is and which was, which is to come, the Almighty. Now, what is your question? Now, now as you teach, um, we are saved before the foundations of the world, but at the same time, there comes a point in time where we must be saved as well. Now, in the same manner, might it be true that um, the Bible was written before the foundations of the world, even though at some point in time, the Bible was also written? Uh, no, the Bible was not written before the foundation of the world. That is clearly taught. For example, when God gives us the illustration of how the Bible came into existence in the book of Jeremiah, it was written, it was, the words were given to Jeremiah to write in the Bible. The law of the Bible, now remember, the Bible has all kinds of pictures and portraits. It talks about burnt offerings and blood sacrifices and nations that did this and did that and so on. Lots of detail, lots of conversations, all uh, in the setting of demonstrating God's laws. But they themselves are not the law of God. They are simply uh, 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 pictures and portraits of, that, are, that are helping us or hindering us from understanding the Word of God, depending on how we how careful we are in the Word of God and whether God opens our spiritual eyes or not. And uh, so it is, uh, it, it, we, uh, we know that God is from everlasting past. We know He made His whole plan of salvation before, uh, and He actually made the payment for our sins before He ever created the world. But uh, he did not write the Bible before the foundation of the world. The Bible clearly shows us that. Okay, well, thank you very much. Thank you for calling and sharing. And uh, shall we take our next call, please? Welcome to Open Forum. Oh, hello, Mr. Camping. This is Mill Valley, California, calling to you. Um, I have a question I was challenged today with someone about the various versions of the Bible that uh, we have. Um, and, of course, I was uh, talking mainly and purposely about the King James, the authorized version. But this person asked me about where did, where is, or how did the King James uh, uh 
people right. that King James uh, uh, well, had translated uh, the King James Bible, where did they get the? Where is the original transcript? The script. I the, guess that's what the, I'm trying to say. The original writings are not in existence. They're not oh. in existence. But in the before the printing press, and that only occurred about 500 years ago, and God began to write the Bible already 3,500 years ago. Uh, the uh, the uh, there are very ancient copies that are pieces of of the of the Bible, and uh, in the various uh, oh, in the various. Um, Museums in England and Russia and other places, uh, and uh, some of those pieces are are have been uh, carefully studied, and and there maybe they were written as early as uh, 200 A.D. For example, as an illustration, uh, when they uh, 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 found a lot of writings in the Dead Sea uh, um, uh, caves. Uh, or near the uh, Dead Sea, uh, which had been hidden there by Jews that uh, lived about 70 A.D. or approximately then, uh, and uh, when they uh, they in the in those caves they found a a copy of the Book of Isaiah that was uh, 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 a thousand years older than any other copy that they ever had. This was. Uh, this was uh, at a time just shortly after the whole Bible was completed, and so they, uh, and that uh, uh, that copy of the Book of Isaiah, which is very close to the original, uh, is can can be read right now. It's in a museum in the nation of Israel, and uh, and this is uh, whether they found a whole book or a little piece, uh, they put all these together. I, uh, they, uh, there's never been an argument about the Old Testament. The arguments have come about the New Testament because about three or four hundred A.D., uh, the uh, uh, the uh, uh, the uh, Roman Catholic Church, which had its beginning about that time, uh, they uh, they translated the the most ancient copies that they could find. And they translated them into the Latin language, and then that was was uh, was proclaimed as being the oldest translation. And then most of most of the translations that followed of the English Bible, uh, they uh, they were translated from the Latin translation, and uh, uh, that means that. Uh, there were errors in the Latin translation, which were carried over into the English translation, and that's why the the King James is very sub superior because it was not translated from the Latin translation. It was translated from earlier uh, copies that they were able to find that uh, that existed before the uh, Latin translation. But uh, it's uh, what we have is. Uh, we can uh, what we have as uh, as the original. Uh, we can be certain that God has protected it, so that we are that we can uh, trust in it very definitely. Praise the Lord! Thank you so much, Mr. Camping. Thank you for calling and sharing. And shall we take our next call, please? Welcome, to Open Mr. Farm. Mr. Camping. Yes. I know. I know you don't believe there's a hell, but you know something, Mr. Canton. Do you realize what kind of world we live in? You know, it's plain to see to me that 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 evil's all around us. And if you think that there's no hell, God bless you, my friend. When you die. Well, now the fact you is, you, you see, say. I don't go to church. This and that. I know what I know, and you can blame the church, put the church down. That's up to you, my friend. You know. You know, isn't it a wonderful that God is the one who decides what is the correct punishment and not we, not we? And isn't it interesting that no matter how grievously someone has been wicked, someone has murdered millions of people like, uh, like Saddam Hussein, 
has been found that kind of a murderer. And uh, what was his punishment? The same as if he had killed one child. The same. He was hanged, and then his body was very carefully guarded so that it would not be desecrated in any way. And yet he committed sins that... Are, are terrible things that were in that were millions of times more serious than that murderer who murdered a child and, or murdered one person and uh, and uh, yeah and yet we expect God well okay we weren't able to uh, get even with him we weren't able to make him suffer and uh, in in relationship to his crimes but God will make him we'll we'll leave it up to God. But if we read the Bible, we find that God has a love for this creation. God has no, the Bible quotes this, that the God has no, uh, uh, no, no uh, uh, he, he, he love for, for killing people. He, uh, he, uh, he, uh, he has no pleasure, uh, the language is, he has no pleasure in the death of the wicked. And Christ wept over Jerusalem. Christ was eternal God, eternal God standing there. And he was showing an emotion that, that he was weeping because Jerusalem, which was under the wrath of God, must be destroyed uh, because of their constant rebellion against God. And he is weeping over them because he has to, uh, they have to die. And so we, we try to make God uh, a a far different kind of a a, a punisher than uh, than what God is. We're not listening to the Bible. We're listening to our own desires because we want vengeance, and we aren't able to give that vengeance on, in our normal living of, of, of trying to bring justice to this world. We can't bring vengeance the way we would like, so we're going to expect God to do it. And the whole thing is out of sorts because we're not listening to God. But thank you for calling in, Sherry. And we're going to take our last call. Welcome to Open Forum. Hi, good evening. Yes, welcome to Open Forum. I have a question that's been bothering me for several weeks. Now, you say there is no hell. Now, if I, if, if I didn't have, if I was not a true believer and I thought that the only, the worst thing that can happen to me is just being dead, what is, what's the, what would make you want to be a true believer? If the worst thing that's well, going to happen know, to you, the fact is, you're dead. The, the, the fact is that the 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 uh, the uh, grace of God is way greater than we ju- than that we don't ju- just don't die. It means that we are given an enormous gift, eternal life, so that we will reign with Christ forever and ever, and be co-owners right. of the new heaven and the new earth. It's an enormous gift, and that is but what that's not that, what I those asked. that's what those people lose out on they die they uh, and uh, but that's because of god's mercy but thank you we've come to the end of our time i'm sorry good night